Hi everyone, and welcome to the Environmental Health Information Session. Before we get started, I'd like just to take a moment to say that the British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam. I'm Julie, I work in the School of Health Sciences. Here today we have with us Aaron Ruggieri, who also works in the School of Health, Darren Tan, he's gonna give a wave, Jennifer Elliott, the Associate Dean, and your presenter for this evening is Martin McLeod. We're gonna go into um, a poll that's gonna be uh, given to you by Martin, a little test. Um, we're going to show you a video. Uh, Martin's going to do a presentation and a program overview. And at the end of it all, we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. Over to you, Martin. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Martin McLeod, and I'm the program head for the Environmental Health Program at BCIT. And I would like to start by, first of all, asking you a question. Uh, and don't worry, it's not for marks. It's not a test. So uh, let's have the poll question up. What is not part, okay, this is negative. What is not part of an environmental health officer's job description? Inspecting food, inspecting water, inspecting fish and wildlife, inspecting tattoo parlors, or investigating communicable disease outbreaks. Check off the one that you think is not part of our job description. Look at that, you guys passed. You're right, the answer is uh, the only one of those that the environmental health does not do is inspect fish and wildlife habitat. The reason I gave you that question is uh, some people are fooled by the word environment in our name. And uh, this is a public health program. It uh, uh, does have something to do with the environment, but it's primarily about public health. So we do not get involved in inspecting fish and wildlife. So if that's your interest, then perhaps this isn't the right program for you, but please listen on and see what we do. All right, let's see the next slide. So uh, what I'd like to do now is just play you a brief video. This is one of our graduate students who's working in Burnaby for Fraser Health Authority. And he's gonna tell you a little bit about what it's like to actually be an environmental health officer. So let's play the video. I'm Zach, I'm from Fraser Health. Pleased to meet you. Wanna well, show you around? Perfect. So today, um, I'm doing an inspection here at this food processor. And we'll be looking at making sure that sanitizers are available, that the staff are following proper hygiene practices, I'm making sure that coolers and other cooking equipment is functioning properly. Um, so there's a wide range of things that we are working towards to make sure that food safety and sanitation are being followed closely. So I love my job because every day is a new day. I enjoy seeing the collaboration uh, with our health unit and seeing their successes because when our operators are successful, we're successful. Our environmental health program here at BCIT trains students to become environmental public health officers or uh, inspectors. And in that capacity, we inspect water systems, restaurants, sewage disposal systems, pools and spas, and we even do tobacco control, making sure stores do not sell tobacco to minors. I chose to um, come to BCIT because it is one of the few schools across Canada that offers the environmental health program. Um, the instructors are all previous environmental health officers and that's great because they can give us a lot of their knowledge and their experience in the field. And they make everything that we learn, they make it really applicable to the job. Here at BCIT, we work you hard. Two years worth of very intensive instructions and we offer a, a three-month practicum to all of our students and so they get their training necessary to become a certified public health inspector after they're done with us. So at the end of the day, uh, it's about healthy communities. It makes me feel good that I've done my part. I'm a member of that community and we get to do it together. And that makes me proud to do my job to be a public health inspector. 
All right, let's talk about environmental health. Let's uh, talk about what it actually is. So let me um, ask you a question. When you turn on the tap and you get a drink of water every day, do you ever wonder if the water is safe to drink? Do you ever wonder who it is that actually checks to make sure the water is safe to drink? Uh, how about when you go to a restaurant or you shop at the grocery store? How do you know that food is safe? When you go to swim at a public pool or you go to the beach, who is making sure that the water is safe to, to swim in? What about when you go to a hair salon or you decide you wanna get a tattoo? Who checks to make sure that the equipment's being properly sterilized and that it's safe to use these things? And I might add during the pandemic right now, who is it that's doing contact tracing out there? Who's actually checking the facilities that are open to make sure they're following the COVID safety rules? These are environmental health officers that are working behind the scenes to do all these things. They're working behind the scenes in every community across Canada to keep you safe and well. And uh, we're called environmental health officers. Otherwise, we're also called public health inspectors. Would you like to be one of us? Would you like to join them? If you want to make a real difference, and if you care about public health, if you like interacting with people in the community, and if you don't want to be stuck in an office cubicle or in a lab all day, this might be the right profession for you. This picture, by the way, this is uh, an outdoor pool of Burnaby Central Park. Yeah, I didn't know they had a pool there either until I saw this one. This is one of our grad students doing an inspection of the pool. She's doing some water testing right now. Uh, this is one of, our, one of our regular duties. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the program itself. Um, at the BCIT Environmental Health Program, uh, we're training uh, students to become environmental health officers. Uh, there are only six schools, by the way, across Canada that are accredited to, to do this training program. We are the only school in BC. We are a two-year full-time Bachelor of Technology program. So at the end of our program, you will get a bachelor degree. Uh, coming into the program, applicants must have a minimum two years of post-secondary education. This is, and we will give you year three and four for your four-year degree. Our courses are really diverse. Uh, we, are also, we are training food inspectors, but we're also training students to inspect drinking water systems, to inspect public pools, personal service establishments, sewage systems, and much, much more. Our students are trained in communicable disease control. They're trained in epidemiology, and it's these skills in particular that have made them so valuable during this pandemic right now. There's a three month practical experience at, BC, at a BC health agency at the end of the program that will give you a direct field experience and we will place you. Uh, you don't have to find this on your own. To become an EHO, to become a certified environmental health officer in Canada, you will have to pass a national certification exam. And this is an exam um, that's given by the national agency and we will prepare you for this exam during the two years you're with us in the program. Lectures, field trips, research, all of these components deliver a very solid pro, uh, educational program based on a combination of knowledge, but also practical experience. We limit our intake to 26 students each year. So the classes are small. And so what this allows for is individual support. You will get to know your teachers and your uh, fellow students. By the way, I should add here that our classes are currently online and they will continue online for the end of this academic year. And we wait for BCIT to make a decision as to whether we'll be online again next September. Next slide, please, Julie. So the kind of candidates that we're looking uh, for this program, these are the qualities that make uh, the best environmental health officers. These are the qualities that employers want. We would like people that are mature, in other words, have some life experience, are practical and able to be assertive. You need to be able to work independently, make decisions, but also be able to work together in teams. Good, in, good interpersonal skills and communication skills are vital to this program. Uh, you have to have strong communication skills because you will be interacting with the public on a daily basis. Good problem solving decision making skills is certainly helpful and we will help you with that during the program. This, uh, 
Oh, okay. I thought there was a photograph on this slide. There isn't. Okay, carry on. Next slide. Benefits of an environmental health career. So if you uh, would like a job that has a lot of variety in it, if you enjoy working with the public, you like helping the community, um, you get to apply your science background. And this is a big reason why a lot of our students join us is they have uh, degrees in biology or life sciences, and they want to apply it in a practical way that does not involve being in a lab. They want to be out there actually using their knowledge. And so this program and this uh, career allows you to do that. You get to work outside the office. How good is that? You get to choose your own day and be out of the office or in the office, uh, basically on your own schedule. You have a lot of responsibility in this job. You're making decisions. You're making important decisions, but you have responsibility, which can be very rewarding. This picture here is one of our graduates in Powell River on the Sunshine Coast, and he's posting a beach uh, for uh, shellfish harvesting, warning uh, the public not to harvest shellfish from this beach. Just another one of our duties. Next slide, please. Our graduates mostly work for government. So uh, very often they work for health authorities, BC health authorities or health authorities across Canada. They also work for First Nations Health Authority. And also uh, they can work for federal government agencies such as the Public Health Agency of Canada, working at airports and other facilities where the federal government um, does inspections. Some of our graduates uh, decide to work uh, for CFIA or Health Canada and they don't need to become a certified environmental health officer for those jobs, just our degree is sufficient. Quality control, some of our graduates who really enjoy food inspection will get jobs as quality assurance managers for food processors, grocery chains, uh, restaurant chains, and uh, are, they do a very good job in those uh, positions. Some of our graduates can work for private consulting firms. There are some of our graduates that actually form their own food consulting companies. Others work for environmental firms. Uh, one of the skills you will learn is how to do air quality uh, monitoring, particularly indoor air quality. And health promotion and education positions are also another area that some of our graduates end up um, being employed with. Whatever your um, interest is in this area, there are, there are jobs out there for you. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a testimonial from Zach. You saw him in the video. Um, Zach is probably one of our tallest graduates we've ever had. You might have noticed in the video. Um, he loves his, his work and he's uh, written something here. Let's just read this for a minute. As an alumni of the BCIT Environmental Health Program, I work as an EHO for Fraser Health, uh, currently working to keep restaurants, personal service establishments and pools in my district up to date with the ever evolving COVID-19 pandemic information. When my son was born, I took two weeks off to be with him and my wife and I now back to work in this rapidly changing time. My colleagues and I are now preparing to be redeployed to case and contact management to assist with case and contact tracing of COVID-19 hours. Be smart, be safe. I hope we are not going to be calling you. So um, a lot of our environmental health officers have uh, been redeployed uh, in, uh, as COVID-19 contact tracers and, and uh, so forth. Their duties have changed a little bit. And then I'm sure when the, when the pandemic is over, they will go back to their regular duties again. Um, all right, so that's our program. Just a little bit about what you need to get into the program. So um, in terms of admission, this is a screenshot from our website. You'll find all of our entrance requirements in detail in the website. So please make sure you browse that. Um, we're looking for uh, an ap uh, strong academic history. So we're looking for two years of post-secondary. Uh, we have a few mandatory courses you're going to need. Uh, a, a background in life in sciences is helpful, but not mandatory. We do have students who have an arts degree, as long as they have the minimum mandatory science courses. Uh, a knowledge of the profession, relevant volunteer work experience, we are requiring that um, all candidates have a minimum one year of work or volunteer experience in what we call a relevant field. And what we mean is we want you to have had some experience in a workplace and secondly, uh, interacting with people, with the public. So um, just put down whatever experience or volunteer uh, experience you have and we can assess that and decide if, if it's, uh, we consider it relevant. 
All right. Next. Uh, the start. So every year we we uh, have 26 seats that we fill. We start um, in September. Okay, and so that is each class starts in September of the next year. So right now we are taking applications for September 2021 start date. Our applications opened on October 1st of 2020, and we will continue taking applications until we are full. And at the moment, we are not full. We still have plenty of seats available. So uh, don't worry about being too late. There's, you can always apply. And again, some of the qualities, uh, I've already mentioned this, strong communication skills. You will need to um, have a, be in good health, okay? And what I mean by that is you are going to be um, walking around, moving a lot. You're going to need to be driving as part of your job. So you do need to be in, in, in decent shape. Strong decision-making, uh, computer literacy, literacy, of course, uh, is required. And uh, those are just some of the qualities that, uh, that are needed. Next slide. So when you apply, uh, first of all, uh, admissions department will review, um, will review your application. You will need to upload your documents to the uh, site application site, uh, your transcript, your uh, what's called a self-assessment form we ask you to complete. We're going to ask you to interview a working environmental health officer. It can be just a phone interview. We give you four questions we want you to ask and you write down your, your responses um, to the questions we ask you. So you will interview the working in EHO and then you will write down your responses and we will also review that, you know, that response. Um, then what happens is the, uh, what will happen is you will be sent to us for a, a review and uh, a department review. So admissions department will make sure you have all the requirements for your application. When it's complete, they will send it to me for a department review where I will do my review and then recommend you be accepted or, with, or that we need more information. We don't do interviews. Uh, it says here multi-mini interviews. We do not do that with our program. Um, okay, and I should, I'd like to mention that program advisors are available. And if you have any questions about the program, you can ask them because they know our program as well. Um, I work with them all the time. Next slide, please. BCIT has uh, some excellent student support services. And this slide just shows some of the supports in, in eight different areas. Uh, I should, I'd like to highlight financial support, especially in this time of COVID, there is financial support available to students. Uh, there are very good um, supports for your health and your mental health. There are counselors available. Um, and so I just like to just, if you look at this slide, you'll just see all the various areas that student services can help you as a student. Next slide. And here are just some contact, some contact information um, should you wish to connect. And you can certainly contact Program Advising. There they are on the bottom, program underscore advising at bcit.ca. They can answer your questions. They do know our program. So please don't hesitate to contact them with any questions. Okay. These are just some uh, social media contact information here. So now questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me that I can try and answer right now? You can post them in the chat or you can put yourself, unmute yourself and just ask the question. Um, <coughs> what if you are working towards getting your driver's license but do not have one at the time you're applying? Okay, I, thank you for asking that. I did mean to mention that. You will need a driver's license by the end of the program. The reason is, is that when we send you out on your practicum at the end of your second year, uh, wherever you go, they're going to be expecting you to drive. So you will need, you should have a full class five driver's license by then. And so when you come into the program, we want you to have as a minimum, a class seven N license. And then during the, the program, you can work towards getting your full license but we won't accept you if, have, if you have anything less than that because there won't be enough time to get your license by the end of the program. 
Now, some students still have their N when they go out on their practicum, and you can do this. Uh, some health authorities will let you um, drive with an N, but you might be limited in what you can do and, and where you can drive. You Thanks, may not be able to use a government car, for example. Next question. Uh, what job experiences are considered relevant? Would you please give some examples? Any, okay, uh, anything to do with food service. So if you worked at McDonald's, uh, that is awesome experience. It can be anything. It can be wiping tables. It can be serving at the till or, or working in the back. Any kind of food service experience is great. Any kind of experience where you have to deal with the public on a regular basis, such as customer service or being a salesperson. Um, if you do any volunteer work, for example, in the hospital or in a care facility where you're working with patients, all this is good experience. And what we're looking for is we're looking for um, having experience working with people. And so I guess I could answer that by saying what we don't want is someone who say has never worked or has only worked say in a lab where you're not interacting with the public. So um, that, I hope that gives you an idea. What I suggest is when you are applying, just put down whatever experience you have and let us review it and decide how, if it's relevant or not, because you never know. Okay. Excellent. Um, our next question. Is this program currently planned to be fully online with the September 2021 start date? If so, how does BCIT plan to adjust the program to ensure we receive all the proper training to equip us to be successful public health inspectors? Well, we are currently teaching online and we've been teaching online since last March. So we're almost coming up on a full year of online teaching and we have adjusted our teaching uh, to online from the classroom. And um, it has, I do, I do think it's working. I think that the students are getting just as strong a training as they did in the classroom. And if necessary, we can take students into the lab and bring them back on campus. And we can even do field trips if we deem it to be absolutely necessary. With planning, these things are still possible. So I would say, don't worry about getting a lesser training because we're online. Uh, we have adjusted our classes to make sure you get what you need. And I also am um, thinking it's probably not going to be online forever. Um, I do think at some point we will be back in the classroom. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, from Rafia, up asking, is foreign work experience valid? Uh, foreign work experience is valid. Yes, uh, we'd be. What we if you're what we'd be more concerned about there is your academic record. If it's from a university overseas, um, we would want it to be evaluated uh, and see if how equivalent it is to a Canadian education. But in terms of just work experience, uh, it doesn't matter where it is as long as you've had that experience. Um, from Bonnie, I just lost your question. I'm curious, so what is the starting pay wage when you are finished if you are successful? Um, it depends on, it, there's a lot of depends in this question. Uh, depends what, where you work, what job you get and what province you're working in. Um, right now, Alberta actually has the highest pay rate in the country, uh, but BC doesn't do too badly. So I would say you're probably going to be making about fifty to sixty thousand a year um, when you start working, which is pretty decent. Plus all the benefits. It's a unionized position, and so you do get excellent benefits as well. Um, if you go to the, uh, it's called CIPHI, Canadian Institute of Public Health Inspection. If you Google their website. They have a site on salaries. If you, there'll be a tab that will direct you to salaries and you're actually able to look at typical salaries across Canada. So I advise you to check that out too. Okay, our next question is, I live in Alberta and have an Alberta's driver's license. Can I still apply to the program? Absolutely. If you have a full license in Alberta, you can apply to the program. And at some point, you're just gonna have to convert it to a BC license. If you, if, if you plan to do your practicum in BC. Now we have students from Alberta joining our program and they would prefer to do their practicum experience back in Alberta. That can be arranged, in which case your Alberta license would be just fine. Where should we volunteer to get relevant work experience? 
Ooh, why don't you volunteer at a hospital or a care home? Mind you, with COVID right now, that may be very difficult. This is a bit different right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic um, or um, any kind of food service. If you could volunteer in a kitchen somewhere for charity, in a, a soup kitchen or a food bank, all of these things are great experience. Um, you just have to uh, just think of any kind of uh, anything that would involve you working with the public. We have uh, uh, one experience I saw in, in my applications was um, working in a cleanup crew, clean, picking up needles in the downtown east side of Vancouver. I didn't know that was a volunteer thing, but apparently it is. That would be excellent too. I have a fascinating question from Shanti. Um, if this program does happen to be online in 2021, is it possible then that one can be a student in this program while still residing in Ontario or another province? It's theoretically possible, yes. If you, um, if uh, however, you get called back to do a lab on campus or if there is a field trip planned, then um, that could be difficult. So you, you basically, you would miss it and it's not great. So I would, I guess my recommendation is, is that you are within sort of a, a day trip distance of campus is best because I can't guarantee uh, which instructors may call students back for something. Um, having said that though, we do have um, a student right now that's in Ontario. Um, when we went uh, online, she flew back home to Ottawa and uh, is doing okay. So it is possible right now when we're online, but I just can't guarantee that if you get into the program thinking that you're gonna be able to stay say in Ontario for the whole program, and then we go back onto campus, um, then you know that could change quickly. So hard to answer that one. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, and for those that are uh, posting really specific questions, we're gonna put in a couple links um, to refer you to our international uh, site and to advising because uh, for qualifying with international marks, there's a specific protocol in place for that. So we're not gonna address that in this forum, but um, we will put in some links for you to look at, or you can email Martin directly. Um, the questions that we're trying to answer here in the live chat are just some of the more general ones that might apply to more than one person. That being said, um, I have a question here that's great. Is um, is an EHO at a different location every day or may spend a few days, weeks at a certain location? Do EHOs work with other EHOs or always alone? Um, EHOs work out of a central office. Usually it's a health authority, health department. And so for example, we saw Zach, uh, our graduate, and he's working in Burnaby. So there is a Burnaby health department uh, near, near City Hall in Burnaby. So he would work with all the other EHOs in an office there. However, he would have a district within Burnaby that would be his alone. So when he goes out to do his inspections, he's working by himself. And uh, normally you would spend a few hours at each facility and move on to the next one, which is why you're, you're, you need a car. You're driving from place to place. So uh, you would only spend a few hours at each place. And then you, at the end of the day, you go back to your office and, and get your paperwork done and plan your day for tomorrow. So it's a combination of working with other EHOs and also working alone on your district. If you work in a rural area, such as in the interior or up north, then you, uh, you will still be in a central office with two or three other EHOs, but your district will be much bigger. And you could spend you know, a whole day in one area uh, with a lot of driving. Uh, so it depends too, if you're working in the city or in the countryside. Thanks, Martin. Um, a question from Shri and then one from Anastasia. So for Shri is asking, has the three month practicum experience extended to full-time jobs for the program graduates? Sometimes it does, yes. Uh, if the health authority where they are doing their practicum um, has a position open, and if they like their practicum student, in other words, the student has really impressed them, at the end of the practicum, um, they will uh, offer employment to the student. Now, the only thing is the student still must pass a national certification exam. So often um, our students will continue to work, this time they're getting paid, um, pending you know, passing that national exam. Uh, for to get full-time employment. 
And so I should mention the practicum is, is an unpaid position. You get a small stipend to help with moving costs, but you are not paid for those 12 weeks. But should it turn into something more, then of course it is an employed, uh, a paid position. And so right now, the environment right now is very good for EHO graduates. Uh, our class of 2020, they have all finished their practicums and uh, the majority of them are continuing to work in the health authority where they did their practicums. So it's been actually a very good year for our graduates. We have a couple of questions about um, applying to the program if you're still taking prerequisites. For example, COM 30 and statistics. So does that have to be completed before you can apply or can you apply as you're taking those courses? You can apply and put where uh, the, the course grade is required, you can put course in progress or CIP. And what that indicates to admissions is that you're working on it. And so it means though that you will not, um, you, you're, you will not be completely processed or you will not get approval until you've actually finished the course and submitted a grade. Now it is possible that you can submit a midterm grade and have that accepted. That is only in cases where there is a time urgency involved. So in other words, if you've applied and, and we've only got say one or two seats left and uh, then we will accept a midterm mark because you may not have time to wait until your final grade comes in. But in most cases, and certainly where we are right now, just put course in progress and wait until you get your final grade and then upload it to your site. And we'll just hold your application and wait for that. Excellent. Um, last question. Can IELTS be valid? Can it be valid? Yes. Uh, BCIT does accept IELTS results, but um, you'd have to talk to uh, BCIT. You'd have to talk to either the program advisor or admissions, or if you're international, talk to the international uh, off student office. They would have more information on that. Excellent. And now we're going to go on to our video. Here at BCIT, we have 32 programs in the School of Health Sciences. They range anywhere from specialty nursing, bachelor of nursing, diagnostics, lab, and allied health programs. We are very unique in that we have one of the largest simulation labs in Western Canada. So the learning model prior to the pivot to online learning it was primarily learners coming on campus to get that foundational knowledge through lectures or group activities. And then they would still have their labs and the experiential learning aspect of it. What we're doing now is more of a blended approach so that uh, instructors can put their lectures online and uh, they can also put group activities online as well. They still need to come on campus to do some of those hands-on components, but we are seeing more of a blended approach. We've really worked hard to make sure that the students get the experience that they deserve, that it meets the learning outcomes and the competencies of the program. The only difference is that we've uh, spread things out a little bit further and sometimes their class sizes are a little bit smaller. But other than that, they're getting the same experiential learning opportunities as always. So we've heard uh, our students say their experience of coming on campus for these simulation labs, they have felt very safe. We've even had students say that they feel safer coming onto campus than they do going into their own local grocery store. And I think that's due to all the organization, the time that we spent over the summer with occupational health and safety. We've marked the hallways with arrows indicating the direction so that we can control the flow, marking the floors so that they know exactly where they need to stand, and the scheduling too so that we don't have all of the students on campus at the same time. They go to the specific bedside that they have been instructed to do so, and then the instructor is ready to start the simulation. In some cases, we actually have them in the back of the room and using a technology called an ELMO, the instructor can be much further away and can actually do a demonstration for all students to see. They don't have to be right next to them. So if a student ever needs an instructor to step in closer to assist, then the instructor with the proper PPE steps in does that assistance and then steps away again. In many cases, faculty will be wearing PPE all day, and that's due to the frequent need to move close to the students to assist them in the lab. And then once the students have completed their simulation experience, then they immediately leave the campus and they can continue on their day. Some of the other unique methods that we've employed is that instead of the students actually coming on campus for a simulated experience, we've shipped some equipment to them. 
Now, as soon as just small pieces of equipment, they actually ran a home-based simulation using family members or people within their bubble, and then they shipped that equipment back to us. We have a highly interactive web-based virtual simulation program that we use, and the learners can interact with 3D avatar patients. And this, we found that it really reduces the amount of time that they come on campus because they hit the ground running when they come to the simulation lab. The students really enjoyed some of these activities that were really just supposed to be a temporary fix. Um, they really want that to continue as part of the program. Uh, so we will continue to do that. We're all looking for creative solutions to continue the experiential learning opportunities that BCIT is known for. And so it's really exciting to see that not only in our programs in the School of Health Sciences, uh, we see that collaboration, but we're seeing this collaboration across the entire campus. So it's an amazing thing to see and experience. And with that, I'd like to thank Martin for the excellent presentation and uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Tomorrow you'll be receiving an email with the slide deck and on Monday we'll be sending you a link to this video so that you can uh, reference it uh, later on if you need to. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Thank you, and if you had questions that weren't answered, just send me an email. There we are, there's my email. Thank you.